Model Engineering for Beginners, Part 15, Workshop Hand Tools for the Model Engineer. A friend of mine recently gave me a collection of very old micrometers. Not this one though, this is a pair of calipers, digital calipers that I've had for ages. Along with the micrometers, there was also a collection of small books. These are very old, one of them dates from 1967, and they're full of tables all about thread cutting and drill sizes, and other useful things that you're going to need if you want to be into model engineering. Small books like this are always very useful things to have laying about the workshop, because you will need to look at them periodically. I already have some books like this, but you can never have too many. One of the books is called Machine Shop Companion, and you do need some help often in a machine shop, so it's going to be useful to have a look through that. Before making this video, I spent a bit of time cleaning up the old micrometers, and also oiling the moving parts of them. On screen at the moment is the micrometer that I use most of the time. It's a Moore and Wright micrometer and it's Imperial. And this one is Metric. I don't do a lot with Metric, but it's good to be able to have a micrometer to do so. And having said that, I have a digital micrometer that does both. You just press a button, one for Imperial and one for Metric. And this is quite good. This is one of the larger micrometers that I've been given recently. And this is going to be very, very useful. If I needed to measure above one inch, because all my other micrometers just measure naught to one inch, I would use one of these things. It's a caliper. Calipers are very popular and very quick to use. And I suppose I would recommend that you have one in the workshop. I personally don't like them very much because they're very sharp and I generally stick them in my hand. Especially this bit at the end. This is a depth gauge. Very useful, but I do prefer things like this. This is also a depth gauge but it's a proper micrometer type in a nice wooden box. And it's generally okay in its standard configuration, but there is a facility to add the longer rods that are in the box. And this of course gives the added bonus of being able to check the depth of a much longer hole in a piece of metal. I do like these old sets in wooden boxes, they're very good quality. The device on screen at the moment is the other end of the scale. This is a very cheap thing, made in the Far East. But it's metric and imperial, and it works, so I can't really complain too much about it. This is another of the old micrometers I was given recently, and it has a gauge with it in order to calibrate the micrometer. Next onto the bench comes a small collection of my Barco spanners. Barco spanners are really good quality adjustable spanners and save me an awful lot of time rummaging through boxes for the correct spanner. This collection of tools on the bench are very useful indeed. I don't use them much at all these days because all the other tools that I have generally do what these do. The self-explanatory, the odd leg calipers, calipers and dividers. Moving on from measuring devices to action devices, this is a centre punch but it's spring loaded, you don't have to hit it with a hammer. Very useful things to have in the workshop, but not quite as useful as this. This is a pipe cutter, a very small pipe cutter. And all you do is put your piece of pipe through the middle of it and rotate it. And after every rotation, slightly tighten the wheel. This forces the cutting blade against the copper. And in no time at all, it will cut through the copper piping. And the good thing about it is it does not leave a burr on the outside edge of the copper. Therefore, you can fit a union cone to it without having to grind the edge. I think I'll speed up the video in case anyone slips into a coma watching this bit. And in no time at all, we have a perfectly cut piece of copper pipe, which is completely free from any burrs around the outside edge of the cut part of the pipe. So a coned union can just fit onto this pipe, after it's been cleaned up with some emery cloth of course, and silver soldered in place. This tool is only suitable for cutting small diameter piping though. If you need to do the bigger stuff, you need a larger cutting tool. Both of these cutting tools I bought at a local plumber's merchant's and they really are very, very cheap. I suppose it's a case of supply and demand. Anything that is mass produced on a large scale is automatically cheaper. If it's a specialist model engineer tool, it's going to be more expensive because less people in the world will buy it. As you can see, this tool is quite efficient at cutting larger diameter piping. Here's a freshly cut piece of pipe, and as you can see, the internal diameter has a slight burr around it. So if you wanted to remove this, you use one of these tools. It's called a deburring tool. I have a couple of these in the workshop, and they really are an essential piece of kit. This one has a plastic body and is fitted with a standard deburring tool end. 
and it's quite safe. It's sharp, but it's only sharp on the inside edge, and it removes the burrs, as you can see here. I also have a better quality one. This is a metal one, and I've had this for many, many years. Same principle, but you press a button, and the tool pulls out. And if you're careful with them, the cutting tools last a long, long time. I think I've only broken one in the last 20 years. So with the freshly cut pipes, they need to be bent. And as I've just said, small items for model engineers are much more expensive than larger ones. This is the smaller of my two pipe benders, and it was about three times the price of the larger one that I'm going to show you in a moment. They really are useful tools for bending pipes at 90 degrees. And here is the larger of the two pipe bending tools, and this was very, very cheap. Both of them will accommodate three sizes of piping. I'm going to move on now to something that you may be surprised about. How to cut glass tubing. Well, it's quite simple. I've done it for years. But recently I trekked myself to a tool to do this, because I was curious to see how good it was. So this is a bit of a review of the tool in question. I've always cut glass tubing like this by using a needle file and just filing around it and then snapping it. But anyway, on we go with the review of this tool. So here is the tool in question, and I bought it from eBay, and it was not very expensive. I think if you pay a couple of pounds extra, the seller will sell you a piece of glass tube, but as you can see, I've got plenty of that. All you do is put the piece of glass tube in the tool, Use your thumb to apply a little bit of pressure so the cutting blade scores the glass all the way around and then snap it. Health and safety warning. So really I should have protective clothing on for this. I would recommend wearing goggles. Maybe an all over biohazard suit would be useful or at least a piece of cloth to stop it from sticking in your fingers. But as it's the only excitement I get in my life these days, I'm going to do it without the aid of a safety net. And I'll do it again. Put the piece of glass in the tool, put a little bit of pressure with your thumb on the button, and then snap it in half. And look at that, really, really good. Much quicker and easier than using a needle file, and it does all kinds of different sizes. I don't have any really huge gauge glasses to cut, but I have some very small stuff. So I'll try this and see what happens. Same principle, into the tool, bit of pressure on the top with your thumb, and in this case, a bit too much pressure on the top with my thumb, and the glass cuts. This is definitely a must for any model engineer's workshop. I definitely recommend it. Over now to some traditional workshop equipment. These are various squares and centre finders and rulers, and bits and pieces that you're always going to need. Very useful items. This is a very useful size of ruler, 7 inches long. And this is a very useful tool also for checking 90 degree angles. And coming in from above now is a very old 12 inch ruler. I can still just about read what's on it. I wish they'd engrave them slightly deeper than they do, but you can't have everything. And what's this in the workshop? A pair of scissors? Am I going to be making dresses? No, not this week anyway. A pair of scissors like this, not to be confused with the horrible plastic things you get from supermarkets, are a great addition to the workshop. I use them for cutting gasket material and even thin brass sheet. This is brass sheet that would be suitable for cladding around the cylinder of a small steam engine. And it's really easy to cut and quicker than using the bandsaw. Also on the bench at the moment, we have some number stamps. I have a set of letter stamps as well. And these are useful for punching numbers onto mating surfaces of pieces of steam engine to show that part 1 goes with part 1 and part 2 goes with the other part 2, etc, etc. I don't actually do much number punching on components, but if I did, I would use some of these. These are a very good addition to any workshop, they're not very expensive, and they're just transfer punches for punching centre marks through holes onto new pieces of metal ready for drilling. I use this a lot. This is a very small mini craft drill, and it's normally fitted with a drum sander, very good for cleaning up pieces of metal, and this, of course, is a very good quality battery-powered drill. And it's great for drilling a variety of holes in pieces of work that are far too large for the pillar drill. And finally, a bit about hammers. This is a soft hammer for hitting things hard without damaging them. This is a small hammer, suitable for riveting. And a slightly larger hammer, suitable for larger rivets. And a really big hammer for brute force. And if you want to take the violence somewhat further in the workshop, a Viking battle axe is a good idea. Alternatively, if you wish to stop the men in white coats from taking you away, 
a proper Danish war axe tends to work a treat. But another health and safety warning, when using Viking battle axes or any other medieval weapon of mass destruction, it is a very good idea to wear substantial PPE, that is personal protective equipment. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.